My name is Josh Bloom, and I'm a professor of astronomy at UC Berkeley. I'm also co-founder and CTO of a machine learning company called Wise.io. So from the sort of domain-specific view of machine learning, we, we basically see that as a, as a tool, just like you might see computation um, or you know, a Hadoop cluster as a tool for you to deal with data and, and do inference on data. So machine learning is already starting to creep into the physical sciences. Um, we are using it in astronomy, it's being used in physics and biology, a number of different places where there's so much data that um, we just can't have people looking at all of it. And so in some sense, that's the break point. If you can't hire enough grad students or you can't get enough people in the crowd to opine on data, uh, you have to start looking towards other techniques. And machine learning has this sort of wonderful generic advantage of being able to approximate human intuition and cognition and, and obviously go uh, beyond that. So when we were dealing with uh, more and more images coming off of telescopes, uh, my colleague's approach was, well, why don't you just hire more grad students to look at the data? Um, and I wound up stumbling upon machine learning because I was being opportunistic. Um, I obviously had heard about it before, but wound up recognizing that when you start putting machine learning into production, the nuances of how you do that, of um, keeping a kind of robust system that's up and running, where you've got real um, kind of clients on the back end, and these are your colleagues saying, hey, the thing went down last night, and I wasn't able to point my telescope anywhere because I didn't know where to, where to look. You wind up realizing that the kinds of machine learning that's done in the academic world, where you write a paper and you wind up saying, well, my scaling curve is nicer than your scaling curve, um, doesn't really apply anymore. I mean, you might use some of the basic concepts, um, and you might there might be some breakthroughs that allow you to do things at scale uh, in, a, in, a, in a better way that you would have been able to do by other means. But um, when you wind up realizing that there are people on the back end of whatever your machine is saying that rely upon it, um, it you get to a sort of whole nother level. So um, we're using machine learning in my academic research really as a way to um, do discovery on images. And so if we take a new image of the sky, um, typically we're looking for new things. And the way you look for new things is you subtract off what was there before. That subtraction process is inherently noisy and um, really kind of dirty process. And so in the end, if you just make sort of very simple cuts on the data, you wind up getting a whole bunch of candidate new things. Um, it's about a thousand bad candidates or bogus candidates, every one real one. And so when you show one of these sort of postage stamps um, to a human, after about three or four examples, they just know what's real and what's not. Um, so something in your brain is actually looking at this data, looking at these images, and doing some high-level inference um, where it's basically learned off of uh, previous experience. So what we do is we train machines to look at known answers. So they look at known bogus examples and known real examples. And then it becomes the real-time classifier that's saying, yes, that's real, that's real, that's real. That then becomes the gateway to another machine learning um, set of algorithms that are saying, given that this object in the sky is real, and given that we saw it last night and the night before, but we didn't see it the night before, and given that the galaxy nearby is red, and given that it's in this part of the uh, sky, et cetera, uh, what type of new thing is it? Is it a supernova? Is it a star that's uh, burping? Is it a black hole that's eating a star? And so you wind up um, doing another set of uh, uh, inference runs on, on that data. Now you're getting into some interesting uh, places where machine learning hasn't spent a lot of time, which is on time series data. And um, what we wind up realizing in our own sort of domain-specific research is that there weren't a lot of tools for us from the um, sort of machine learning world to be able to apply to this. And so we actually wound up hiring some uh, postdocs in computer science and statistics to start kind of innovating machine learning algorithms. So it was this very interesting confluence where you know, we were doing sort of novel inference that, by the way, if you do it well, it means that you can discover things that people um, couldn't have done in the past because it's a massive needle in the haystack problem um, and really push the envelope of different types of uh, sort of time domain science. But at the same time, we were bringing sort of data sets and challenges with those data sets uh, back into sort of the, the hardcore um, stats and ML world and finding some beautiful places where you know, PhDs could be written and actually were in my, in my group um, in, in statistics because we needed to know how you take learning from one project, for instance, and transfer it over to another one in the context of noise and the different way in which you sample the sky. So um, what you wind up finding is that, that connection of, of novelty that 
where you know domain science is sort of using machine learning as a toolkit, yet uh, you know the kind of domain science questions that we have and the data that we uh, bring to bear wind up actually becoming sort of novel sandboxes for uh, sort of basic methodological research. The great example is Galileo, which I which I noted in my talk, where he takes this. Uh, you know, telescope invented for military purposes to look for ships coming over the horizon, and he basically points it upwards and, you know, finds the, you know, the moons around Jupiter um, and really changes our whole notion of where we are in the universe um, with just a couple observations with this new tool. Um, we're using uh, advanced statistics, we're using new computational engines all the time. And in fact, one of the great examples from not so much a software or algorithmic perspective in astronomy is um, kind of the invention of CCDs, uh, which are you know, now part of our uh, smartphones, right? And part of essentially everything we do for, for imaging. Astronomers have been using um, photographic plates, which are less uh, sensitive um, than CCDs are. Um, and we were essentially digitizing them into something that we could actually measure very precisely in zeros and ones. Um, doing that directly with uh, charge couple devices was one of the main sort of use cases of what drove um, CCD development, you know, at Bell Labs, uh, you know, sort of 40 years ago. Um, so astronomers have also sort of been pulling on um, industry in various different places uh, for a long time. Um, and now when we're using machine learning as just, it's in some sense just yet another tool for us to be able to do the novel science that we're trying to do. One of the great sort of vindications of putting machine learning into production for me from a scientific perspective is that we were able to do things that we wouldn't have been able to do by any other means. In some sense, that's the, the greatest imperative and like the gauntlet that I lay down in front of anyone is that you're not doing machine learning because it's cool and it's fun and you can learn something about the data from the past. You're trying to really use it as a tool uh, for, the, for the future as new data winds up coming in. So one of the great things is our uh, machine learning algorithm and framework wound up finding a new supernova that was in a very nearby galaxy. Um, and because it was found uh, about 11 hours after explosion, which were days earlier than had ever been found for that type of supernova before, um, it allowed us and a number of other groups around the world to use the world's largest telescopes at all different wavelengths, pointing at that one place in the sky, gathering lots and lots of data. Um, and that led to a number of nature papers, a lot of insights into the nature of that explosion. And these types of supernovae, for instance, are the ones that tell us about the expansion of the universe. And it's amazing that we had one essentially in our own backyard that we were able to pick up and get so much data on so quickly because we're now able to understand something that we didn't understand before with uh, these types of events. So the reason why it was found in some sense um, is because of the hardware. The hardware uh, was capable of basically looking at a large part of the, uh, of the sky and taking data essentially every one minute. Um, and it happened to be that the telescope was looking at essentially the right place um, at the right time. In some sense, the existence of toolkits like we built uh, for machine learning uh, for, for this uh, telescope project was the enabling factor that allowed the hardware to be built in, in a sense that if you were taking data and no one was looking at it and throwing it into the can, um, and you know, five years later somebody was going through the archives and realized you had a really important supernova in it, that would be great and we'd be excited about it, but we wouldn't have been able to do the science that we did. So the two kind of work um, you know, hand in hand. Because the software exists that can actually sift through and look at that data as if it's you know, essentially virtualized graduate students with a huge amount of domain knowledge and do this at scale, um, it allows you to take more and more data. So it seems a little bit strange to think about you know, an astronomer starting a company that's addressing sort of more pedestrian or more earthly problems um, like churn, um, like the ways that companies interact with their clients uh, and trying to improve and make those interactions more efficient. Um, but when you wind up thinking about it, uh, we wind up learning in astronomy how to deal with real world data. I mean, of course it's not real world, it's outer worldly data, but it's taken with conventional um, sensors. It's got um, you know, conventional needs of being able to serve insights uh, in a regular basis. And rather than sort of create some sort of IP that we wind up transferring over, what we wind up doing is we wind up creating the, the know-how um, of what it means to take not some super sexy algorithm and apply it to a toy amount of data, but to take that and the toy amount of data, wrap it up in a platform that we wind up building, um, and then serving the results out in a way that are consumable, and in particular ones that create this, you know, we all call actionable insight. This idea that I'm telling you this is a place in the sky to look, 
do something about that. Or I'm telling you that you, this customer is going to churn in three days from now with this level of probability. You might want to do something about that. Well, the, the point is, and, and this is sort of the conceit of all data-driven approaches, is that you don't need to have a theory about why something's going to happen. The idea is that you've got enough data, both in, in terms of the number of examples and then also sort of the dimensionality of the data, that you can train a very uh, good grad student or you can train a very good algorithm to learn from the past so that as new examples wind up coming in, they're not exactly the same as the previous examples, but if I know that a client which is um, you know, not logging into you know, my software product uh, for, for one week um, is three days late or more on, on making a, a monthly payment to me, and the only person that's uh, used that is the CTO and not the people that it was actually meant for, that becomes a very huge signal so that when another client does something like that, um, you can wind up basically surfacing that. And, and so the actionable insight that we wind up sort of learning how to do with astronomy data in real time on, on noisy streaming data uh, is exactly that sort of same know-how that we wind up applying to, to more of these conventional problems. I mean, one of the things that's uh, important to recognize is that machine learning or machine intelligence is already part of our lives. Um, we all know about Amazon recommendation engines. Um, spam has gotten a whole lot better as we wind up building up these adaptive filters that are using a, a large amount of machine learning and importantly are kind of personalized to you. So the story that I wind up telling is that you know, if your dad is a Viagra salesman who travels to Nigeria who just won the lottery, um, you probably want to see that email from him, right? But um, most people don't um, because those are all signals of, of potential spam. Um, and so what you wind up getting is uh, if you can do machine learning at scale, you're not just sort of creating a single model for, for everybody. It allows you to create uh, many models for cohorts of people. Or the manifest destiny is everybody has their own machine learning models built upon their own past behavior, perhaps leveraging some of the insights that you wind up getting from the whole system. Um, but it's already part of our lives, right? And, and what you wind up noticing is that the, the why of why an answer is, is, um, is told you is something that Google's already doing, for instance, with the sort of new way of thinking about uh, mail, where they say, well, th we think this is a travel update, or we think this is a, a social update, and allows you to go in and say, well, actually, it's not, right? So it, it gives the feedback loop, which is very important for learning. And every time you give that feedback loop uh, and, and a new piece of data, that becomes a new moment for the machine uh, to learn. So it's there, it's obviously you know, mining over credit card interactions, et cetera. But the, the view of, of, of our company and the thing that I, I'm very excited about is that there's so many different places where machine learning can make the um, interactions that, that companies have with their clients more efficient and more meaningful. Um, and those places are not yet being well served. I mean, the, if you think about kind of where analytics is, um, there's sort of the um, descriptive analytics world uh, where you, at best you're kind of rolling up into beautiful pie charts for people to look at and get sort of an aggregate sense of what's happening. Um, that can be real time, but tends to be something that's more in a reporting sense. And then beyond that is you know, maybe some level of intelligence where you wind up building some uh, very basic models into the system and, and do some level of forecasting. Um, and so you get some notion of, uh, of prediction out of that. But sort of the destiny of where all this is going is that you don't have to come to the table ex ante with a notion of um, what is the you know, physical model that describes um, this behavior. The data itself winds up becoming the thing that you create your generative model out of. And that's deeply what machine learning is all about, is that you don't have to come to the table with that, with that sort of set of biases. Um, being able to do that uh, at scale, being able to do that in a production environment is very hard. And what, what we believe, and I think is being very well borne out by the, the difficulties that many companies are having in, in hiring their own data science team, is this idea that um, you know, in the future, people are just going to be buying products where machine learning and machine intelligence are baked in. It's just how that product winds up working. It is, it is, a, you know, it is an assistant. It is the you know, kind of um, intellectual appendage to the people that are using that product on a, on a daily basis.